uh, yeah, Antonio and Luigi Rossolo in 1910 invented mechanized noise. They, what they wanted to do uh, was deal with um, the idea of um, industrial noise or the noise around us rather than music, rather than people creating music. So they tried to mechanize it. That's where my interest in sound started. But this talk is not just about famous people who fiddled around with massive great trumpet speakers trying to make ridiculous noises. I titled this Sonic Warfare. Sonic Warfare because sound is synonymous with war. And I want to illustrate some of the uses of sound um, in order to create fear, in order to hurt, in order to maim and kill. In order to do that, we need to understand, and I am no scientist. Dr. Flaherty is here, I am now sweating. Right. So, I think most of you in your studies will have looked at sound waves. So that's where we're going to start. Because sound is a physical entity, it's a thing. It's particles moving in waves. Vibrations causing waves increasing and decreasing of pressures and it goes in a direction so we can target it. I am targeting you with noise now and with this little black box here later. So it's the to and fro motion of air molecules, so it's the build up and release of pressure, waves. That seems quite straightforward to me, I understand the idea of a wave in the sea and the way in which it can build, and the way in which the pressure increases and decreases, and I like splashing around in, in the summer. That makes sense. Air is the same. Sound is the same in many ways. Just that we can't see the particles. So it's a physical thing. As I speak, I'm causing those vibrations, those pressure waves, and they are all hitting your ears, get the little vibrations through these tiny little bones in your ears, right? And then that's transferred to our amazing brain. And we use it, but we also feel sound. And that's what we need to get across today. Sound is not only something which enter our ears and then we think about, it's something which is actually a physical entity. When you listen to loud music, you feel the vibrations of that music, not just hear the sound of it. Okay. You just need to be aware of that. So, I'm going to begin with a bit of, some would say, mythology, religion. The walls of Jericho, Joshua chapter 6. Okay. Um, Jericho was a city in Canaan sinful place, a place full of prostitutes, but almost impregnable, impregnable, 10 foot high walls, 14 foot thick, okay? Archaeology, that's the real world, says that Jericho existed and it did have a massive infrastructure of wall. Unfortunately, the archaeologists also said that it was in its prime in about 1500. Okay. However, the mythology is that God told the Israelites, going to the promised land, that they could conquer Jericho by walking around it silently for six days and then shouting and blowing horns on the seventh. <coughs> Stupid idea. It's never going to work. And in terms of physics, no, it's, it's never going to work. But God said that was what they had to do. And so they believed and they did. And the walls of Jericho came tumbling down. It's a mythology. It's not science. It wouldn't happen. The evidence is that Jericho's walls were destroyed by earthquake. So we can dispel that the myth is a reality. However, the sentiment behind it is what is important for today. If we have a faith 
or a belief in something, anything is possible. We can insurmountable things. We can use sound to physically destroy something. It is good versus evil. In this case, it is moral versus sinful. And the morality wins with the power of sound. Now, the Italian futurists, who I was playing you at the beginning, were working between 1910 and 1920 25. There's Luigi and, and Rodolfo, Rosolo, with their mechanical musical instruments, bizarre boxes and trumpets, and mechanisms within each of those creating sound. But again, they created this form of music that we now and that most of the young people here are familiar with as electronica, mechanized or electronic based music, um, in order to replicate the change in the world. This is part of the modernist movement for anyone who is older and is studying at that level. Futurism is part of the modernist movement. But what is really important I know that would be very difficult for you to read. But their motivation was this. In modern warfare, mechanical and metallic, the element of sight is almost zero. The sense, the significance, and the expressiveness of noise, however, is infinite. From noise, the different calibers of grenade and shrapnels can be known, even before they explode. Noise enables us to discern a marching patrol in deepest darkness, even to judging the number of men that compose it. From the intensity of rifle fire, the number of defenders of a given position can be determined. There is no movement or activity that is not revealed by noise. They were creating music based on sound, based on the whole idea of um, a military insight, a sense of war, the First World War, the first mechanized war, the really mechanized war, um, and the recognition that sound was as powerful an agent as anything else. The fear that it engenders, not in an individual, but in groups of people. And the nature of our urban lifestyles with its constant humming, its constant noise, that's what they were trying to replicate. I'm going to play you a little bit of Luigi Rousseau. Okay. So this is what urban... Understanding of vibration and the effects. There were people in the audience in Paris in 1910 11 when they first started to do this, and especially after the uh, horrors of the First World War, where entire audiences would faint and scream and run because of, that was coming out of a box. Those noises were coming out of a box. There was no human being present on stage. It was an orchestra of machines. And it, was, it filled people with fear. But not only did it fill people with fear because of the concept, the idea, but it filled people with fear because the vibrations were so strong and so loud and so forceful. So physically, it filled people with fear. 
but it's a reference to war. The walls of Jericho. Good fighting evil, moral versus sinful. The insurmountable surmounted by sound vibration. The futurists, the first world war, the urbanity of our lives, the vibrations that we are feeling right now, even if we've all remained completely silent. Part of the same idea. Let's bring it up to date. Okay. Now, in Israel, since 2004, and I use this example and the example of Jericho the first, the Israeli military, the Air Force, have been using sound in order to disrupt, punish, um, force their will upon the people of Gaza. They've been using sound. And they have said that to create an illusion of death and fear is better than actually killing people. Now, um, Unfortunately, sonic bomb warfare, or the use of aeroplanes to create sound bombs, um, repeatedly, from the hours of 2 in the morning till 5 in the morning, on a daily basis over weeks and months, has physical effects on the people who are disturbed by those pressure vibrations. Um, there have been over 600 cases of miscarriage directly related to the sonic warfare of the Israeli government. There are um, cases of earache, headache, nausea, heart attack, because of a sound. I'm not going to go into the science of the sound, because it's, but it's about when an aeroplane reaches the speed of sound. When it bursts through what we call Mach 1, there's a sonic boom. The Israeli military have been flying at Mach 1 and reaching Mach 1 as they go over the settlements in Gaza. And it creates a sonic boom. Okay. And that sonic boom, the vibrations, have led to some terrible, terrible... Um, you know, problems. Not only that, but infrastructure as well. Every time it happens, there are broken windows. We all know that we can break glass with sound. This is happening um, at the moment. So we've got broken windows, ear pain, nose bleeding, anxiety attacks, sleeplessness, hypertension, the feeling of being shaken inside. But the Israelis say it's preferable to real bombs. Now, going out on a limb here, I'm going to try and replicate a sonic boom. For those of you who do have very sensitive ears, you may want to put some fingers somewhere. I'm not being too dramatic. Right. This will be a very short clip. This is going to be very loud for 10 seconds. Um, yeah, you perhaps do need to put your fingers It's not going to kill you, and you're not going to have a heart attack. Right? So you can feel it. It's an illustration. That's nowhere near as loud as a sonic boom. Nowhere near as loud. Okay. But the point is that it's being used in warfare now. It's being used um, in order to, in order to um, destroy the lives of people. It's being used in order to disrupt their sleep. Obviously, you can't sleep through a sonic boom, right? Um, 
and uh, done repeatedly and repeatedly over night after night. Of course, it creates these anxieties and all of these problems. But the vibrations themselves mean that for any time you hear any loud noise, you get that same urge, that same feeling. So you all heard, the, you all felt the vibration that I did. I'm standing right behind them. So, and there, there reaches a point where it can be difficult to breathe because the vibrations and the pressure is so strong. Right, this is my favourite bit of sonic warfare, if you can have a favourite bit of war. On a scale of war, this is my favourite. Because in many ways it's ludicrous, but in many ways very effective as well. And during the Vietnam War, there was an operation called Operation Wandering Souls. Um, and uh, you can, the helicopter that you can see there is a helicopter which has um, a howler attached to it, which are these huge, great speakers. Um, and they used to fly um, around the, uh, um, out into the jungles where the Viet Cong, especially the snipers, were in wait. So this was a, a psychological um, use of sound in war. So you'd have sniper positions where people were still and, and waiting for American troops um, to go out and try and clear the forests of Viet Cong fighters. Um, and obviously, in a dense jungle, guerrilla warfare wasn't America's thing. It wasn't used to that kind of warfare. Um, and it was losing heavily to these very well camouflaged um, sniper positions. So the quote at the bottom of the way is from Apocalypse Now, the film, which is about uh, the Vietnam, Vietnam War. We'll come in low out of the sun and about a mile out, we'll put on the music. So, um, the music is not actually music, um, but um, they were attempting to frighten the, uh, the Viet Cong by uh, by playing this. they were actually trying to do, they were actually replicating and trying, they were using Buddhist chanting, Buddhist chant and, and, and the music that's synonymous with Buddhism, and then they were overlaying that with haunting voices which said, Daddy, Daddy, please come home, we don't want to lose you, Daddy, Daddy, please come home, we don't want to lose you, and then, um, who is that, who is that speaking, speaking to me, ah, do you want to come with me into the darkness, so it was, what it was doing was really trying to be this psychological warfare, this immersive sound. And surrounding these snipers who were holed out in the, in the jungles waiting for the American troops to, um, to attempt to clear them. And they were being played this noise. They were being played these voices from the ancestors telling them that, no, if they stay there, they've got to die. They've got to run away. They've got to go away. And it didn't have any effect. No, it did. Um, it did. Um, it, it, it affected them. Um, 
It affected, um, yeah, the, the morale of the Viet Cong tremendously. And when it was first used, it was, it was a, a tremendous psychological um, importance to, to the Americans in clearing areas of, of jungle. Um, it's not the only American use of sound in warfare, though. Um, um, another great one, um, shock and awe tactics. Right. Could have been me, that could you? Right, anyway, um, but the vehicle in the picture is of a targeted sound device. So this is used on the streets of Britain as well, and it's used all over the world now. It's quite regular for riot control. So what we have is targeted sound. So if there's a group, especially of adolescents, of people like you, who are running amok in the streets, hanging around on street corners, doing the wrong thing and being idle, then um, one of these vehicles might drive past you, um, and you wouldn't, I wouldn't hear anything. But you would start to feel very, very uncomfortable. And they emit very high-frequency sound waves, the kind of things you have in electronic rat traps that we can't hear. Some of you might have them for cats, to stop cats in your garden. You, you can, you know, these are commercially available, the tiny ones. Where, you know, if a cat comes into your garden, it hates the sound, but you can't hear anything. Which is amazing that there are those sound waves, there are these, these elements of the world. Anyway, there are some for kids. You can buy them for kids. <laughs> I'm going to invest. Um, <laughs> but shock and all, <laughs> uh, I've got three children, I'd quite like to go away. Right, so, um, but, but, the, but the police and the military use these very high frequency in order to make it intolerable to be in the vicinity. And the point is that it's the pressure waves are so intense that it's actually very difficult to stay anywhere near. So if you see um, a, a riot van with um, that big square box on the top, A, you're probably in the wrong place, and B, you need to move. Right. Good. So shock and awe is this ability to target sound waves as well. There are rumours that the United States military are, target, are making targeted sonic weaponry. So that means, obviously, there's no physical indication that anyone's been harmed that can actually cause internal bleeding. The vibrations being so intense that you'll actually rupture inside. I'll leave that for you to investigate with the American military. Right. The other use of sound in warfare is deprivation. And this is something which, again, is very topical because deprivation is associated with torture. So the, most ex the, the best example is when um, the Americans were trying to capture and, um, and, 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 and bring to trial um, General Noriega in Panama. Um, and he was holed up in a house, and obviously he had supplies, he had supporters, and they, the American government couldn't get him out. So they decided to deprive him in the ancient world of siege tactic, the walls of Jericho, um, again, Right versus wrong, good versus evil, anything is insurmountable, use sound. Okay, so deprivation. So, um, and a classic from the um, American military at the time, the quotation there, these people haven't heard heavy metal. They can't take it. If you play it for 24 hours, your brain and body functions start to slide. Your train of thought slows down and your will is broken. That's when we come in and talk to them. So, not a new tactic. Um, so, let's have some American uh, deprivation torture music, shall we? This was genuinely played to General Noriega. It is a song by Van Halen, the heavy metal band, and it's called Panama. Yeah, I lasted 25 seconds. Right, <laughs> I give in. I, it's a fair call. Okay, um, but yes, played heavy metal music over days and days and days to deprive Noriega of sleep, predominantly. But also, propagandism as well. Good old-fashioned American heavy metal. I believe there was a lot of Bruce Springsteen on the playlist as well. Um, um, and etc. etc. Okay, so um, that's deprivation. Um, 
And not only is it used in that way, but it's mainly used to deprive people of sleep. So in Guantanamo Bay, there's a lots of evidence and lots of use of torches, which, uh, uh, which, which, which meant that, that sleep was, um, uh, was de well, you're deprived of sleep. And you just can't function. I mean, you know, a deprivation of sleep can, you know, eventually kill you. You, you, have, you have to give in to it. Psychologically, it is very, very damaging. And when, on a tiny scale, when people say you need your eight, ten hours of sleep, you really do. And you do start to go insane if you haven't got enough. Look at me. Back to my three children again. Right. Okay. So, um, it's not all doom and gloom, though, fortunately. Because the real purpose of this talk, it's not just to say how horrible people are, or that sound can be very, very painful in many different ways. Because if that's true, and if we can create fear, if we can create physical damage through sound, then we can also do the opposite. We can create happiness. We can create any mood that we want. We can create unity rather than destruction through music. Now, my love of music and my love of sound originates from my mm, somewhat dubious teenage years when I got involved and enjoyed the Manchester music scene. I am from Manchester. I didn't run away there. Okay. Um, so we've had all of these ideas. But sound and vibration can be unified. Well, now I'm not saying that unification is always good, because that can also lead to a mob and a psychology where we abandon ourselves. It's about the way in which we abandon ourselves that is important. So I'm going to end today's talk, I hope, with euphoria. Okay. Now, this won't be everybody's euphoria. In fact, it will probably only be mine. I'm going to play you a final piece of music, which is regular in beat, which has very strong vibrations, and I hope that you will leave either traumatised or happy, I don't mind which, particularly, but I will end with something that I love. <laughs>